And so we're going to talk about three viruses um, here, really actually more than three viruses. Uh, the focus is going to be on chronic virus infections, and we'll um, spend most of the time on hepatitis C and HIV. And at the end, I'll mention the human herpes viruses, which are a collection of multiple viruses uh, and how they compare um, and um, special issues that they raise. So hepatitis C virus is an RNA virus. It is a positive stranded virus uh, like coronavirus that we were talking about earlier, but it's a member of the flavivirus family. It was isolated in 1989 and the first treatments emerged in the early 90s. And we'll talk about what those were. Um, really large numbers of uh, infections worldwide. And up until recently, the number one indication for liver transplant in the US. It's an incredibly productive viral infection with uh, high numbers of viral particles produced per day uh, and a very short half-life of only three hours in circulation. There are six major genotypes. So there's viral diversity, just like we saw for flu, that uh, three of which dominate in the US. Quite a lot of genetic variation among the genotypes and a reasonable amount of variation among viruses within a single patient. If you think about um, uh, you know, 5% uh, genetic variation, it's really quite high. Uh, and it replicates, uh, even though it's positive stranded, it actually replicates via its negative strand uh, RNA in a membranous web in the cytoplasm, which is a, a relatively unique um, structure that is only seen in, in HCV. Uh, so the, um, the virus uh, generates this one long polypeptide. Uh, so each of these, this is one long uh, protein uh, amino acid string that then has to be subsequently cleaved into the functional subgroup proteins. So just like we've seen before, if there's an NS designation, that usually means it's a non-structural protein, which means it's providing some kind of um, uh, usually non-essential in one sense uh, function of the um, of the of, of the virus infection, um, but uh, uh, often a regulatory uh, role um, re that's really critical. And these proteins are not included in the viral uh, structure itself. And then it has an envelope protein and a capsid protein. Uh, and uh, actually, I should take that back about amount essential because the in this case the polymerase is actually one of the non-structural proteins. So again, uh, it's an enveloped virus uh, like we've been uh, uh, talking about. So you see this kind of envelope here, uh, meaning it's stealing part of the cell's membrane. And that's, uh, we're not really talking about unenveloped viruses, uh, I think at all today, um, but um, something like adenovirus is an unenveloped virus where you have just a, a hard capsid protein shell and, and no uh, host membrane. Uh, so the life cycle, again, um, sort of similar to the other viruses we've been talking about, except that this is going to become a chronic infection. Um, but it, uh, the virus uh, enters the cell through an endosome. Um, we'll talk about some of its uh, binding receptors in a minute. Uh, it uncoats. Again, then you have to get out of this endosomal structure. And then it forms its replication in the cytoplasm in this, in this large structure here, uh, which is that membranous web. Uh, will then uh, have its own protein production uh, go onto the Golgi complex and assemble at the cell surface and release. There's a lot of time spent looking for HCV viral entry factors. And unlike, uh, it it's sort of falls somewhere between uh, SARS-CoV-2 and something like flu, where flu combined almost anything, SARS-CoV-2 has a very specific protein. Uh, HCV has a number of specific proteins uh, for which it has varying levels of specificity. Um, and uh, some of these proteins are thought to require uh, all members to, to um, uh, work together. So uh, any single one of them is necessary and not sufficient. Um, but it's not an obvious um, specific motif or anything in any of these proteins that's driving uh, um, infection. So the HCV uh, life cycle, uh, once it's inside cells, um, it preferentially replicates within the epithelial cells of the liver. And um, the HCV associated disease is a function of the fact that there's this very high production rate of this virus, putting a lot of stress on the epithelial cells of the liver. So you have this cycle of um, necrosis of the infected liver cells. So they eventually die from the HCV infection. I mentioned that it's an incredibly productive infection. So you're making lots and lots and lots of virus. And then as a result, killing lots and lots and lots of epithelial cells, which will then heal themselves. So your liver is actually very good at regenerating itself. It can regenerate itself from a very small portion of tissue. But if you do this chronically, this proliferation, 
uh, eventually uh, those cells will exhaust and become um, um, senescent. And uh, also the, the, the repeated low level damage to the liver is gonna cause something like cirrhosis where you have these fibrotic lesions forming in the liver. So you have an absence of a productive epithelial layer and so uh, the extracellular matrix expands to fill in those gaps and you start getting this fibrotic liver uh, that's uh, non-functional uh, and basically scarred. Uh, and then what this will lead to is um, additional proliferation to try to make more liver since your liver is not functioning at a, a high level. Uh, and this high, high turnover late rate is gonna allow for mutations to occur and uh, genomic instability and eventually hepatocellular carcinoma driven by the HCV itself. So a, a tumor. So what arms of the immune response are useful against HCV? It's gonna be the big three again that we've been talking about for intracellular pathogens. Uh, so innate immunity, uh, the initial control of the virus is gonna be really critical. Antiviral effectors such as the type one interferon that act on host cells. And here again, we really want interferon to work because we're trying to limit the spread of this virus throughout the organ. Uh, in principle, you would think we would want antibody-mediated clearance, just like we do in, in flu, but the um, liver is not a mucosal surface, right? It's a tightly packed um, stromal tissue, and it's not like we're exchanging with a mucosal surface where uh, the virus is spreading through space and time where antibodies might be particularly uh, helpful. So in principle, you think antibodies should be able to remove the virus as it spreads to cell, to cell but in actuality, the correlation of antibody with HCV clearance and outcome is controversial or actually totally lacking. Patients with high levels of neutralizing antibodies can maintain chronic infection. So even neutralizing antibodies against the virus that they have, and that indicates that these neutralizing antibodies are not sterilizing. And that's likely because uh, the virus is thought to be able to pass um, from cell to cell through tight junctions between the cells. So it's never exposed extracellularly. It's infecting multiple cells without ever being available for antibody clearance. So that's gonna put a lot of focus on cell mediated clearance and particularly CD8 T cells and, and killing the uh, infected cells. Uh, and this is the primary means of long-term control. So starting with innate immunity, uh, there's been a number of studies looking in patients and in non-human primate models of HCV where um, uh, uh, early after people are infected, there's a rapid rise in type one interferon induced genes and that these can interfere directly with viral replication. So they reduce protein synthesis by inhibiting uh, initiation factors in um, uh, 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 viral synthesis, and they can directly target the viral RNA. So there are enzymes, RNases, that will seek out cytoplasmic RNA of certain structures, uh, these patterns, again, pattern recognition that will degrade the viral RNA. And so this is looking at um, gene expression with red being up in terms of things that go up very early in the epithelial cells after HCV infection. So interferon-induced genes, MHC class one to try to recruit in CD8 T cells uh, to kill the virus um, and, and so forth. So these are really critical for setting up the eventual um, uh, adaptive response. And, and this is a case where the innate response is definitely not going to be able to control on its own. It's a highly productive virus and this very sort of ideal environment for viral replication. And so we're going to have to set up a good uh, adaptive immune response. Um, uh, HCV is actually really well studied from the innate recognition side because it generates these double-stranded RNA structures in that membranous web that leads to recognition by multiple innate pathways. So that includes these rig eye like receptors that we were talking about the first day. That's a parallel of the TLRs and the NLRs. And actually rig eye, which is one of the more famous uh, innate pattern recognition receptors, was discovered by Michael Gale in the context of HCV infection. And so this was the sort of founding, um, you know, founding disease in which this pathway was originally uh, uh, identified. Uh, Michael Gale went on to define many ways in which HCV via these non-structural proteins actually tries to interfere with this recognition. So uh, it actually has a protein that um, goes and cleaves off this other protein called IPS1 from the mitochondria of the host cell. And IPS1 is the scaffold on which rig eye sits to launch the type one interferon response pathway. And so HCV is so attuned to the host that it's in is it actually makes a protein that goes through and just chops off a key component of the innate signaling pathways. Uh, and so that's going to dampen the innate response and qualitatively shift the innate response. 
And what we're really trying to promote with the early innate response is the recruitment of uh, professional innate immune cells like monocytes, macrophages, and dendritic cells that will uh, learn the microenvironment of the infection in the liver and prime the appropriate adaptive immune response that will eventually shut down the infection. And that adaptive immune response is again gonna be this type one response, TH1 response, characterized by the production of the cytokine interferon gamma and the induction of CD8 T cells that are gonna come in and kill the virus. As in contrast to something like a TH2 response, which again, we would use for large extracellular pathogens like a worm. And this is really important in the liver because we have a lot of worms that live in and around the liver. And so the, there's a, a, you know, a, a, a strong potential for inducing that kind of response in those tissues. So um, we're gonna talk towards the end of this little section about some of the um, drugs that have been used for um, HCV. But um, before the uh, treatments were available, it was very clear that there were people that actually responded uh, remarkably well to HCV infection. They basically controlled it themselves. Um, and <laughs> these people were called uh, people that had a sustained virological response. And a lot of study was put into them to try to understand why they were so effective. And it was shown to be uh, correlated very well with robust adaptive immunity. Um, and so the, the, the punchline, and I'll take you through this slide more carefully, is that really broad immunological repertoires, that means targeting multiple epitopes, multiple pieces of the virus with diverse T cell populations, were able to control acute and prevent the development of chronic HCV infection. So this was both on the CD4 and CD8 T, T cell side with antibodies appearing to play no role. Okay, so this is the profile of someone with one of these good sustained virological responses. So first it's looking at their HCV RNA levels, goes up very quickly after infection, uh, is controlled, might spike back up again. Remember, this is now in the order of months where earlier today we were really talking on the orders of hours to days for those acute viral infections. Uh, and then this person has basically undetectable viral RNA by six months. Um, their liver function is being measured here with this ALT. This is a liver stress enzyme. And so when it's very high, it means there's a lot of liver damage going on and that correlates perfectly with the amount of virus that's around. Um, the number of different epitopes, meaning the number of individual peptide MHC combinations that can be seen by the T cell responses in these individuals is shown here, uh, both for CD4 and CD8 T cells. So it goes up and it stays up and it's very high. And then they actually work out which epitopes are seen. So which pieces of which proteins in the virus in the context of different MHC molecules are seen by um, the uh, CD4 and CD8 T cells. And they're distributed across multiple proteins from multiple stages of the viral life cycle. And that diversity is maintained even as the magnitude drops, but the magnitude's dropping because the amount of viral RNA is dropping. And so there's less antigen there, there's less for the immune system to do. And so it will naturally contract. If you look at antibody responses, um, there's a EIA is an ELISA. This is a way of measuring total antibody. Total antibody levels go up and <clears throat> stay up very high. Neutralizing antibodies make up a small proportion of that response, but these people are still controlling and clearing the viral infection. So again, there's a lack of correlation between neutralizing antibody and uh, the amount of viral RNA measured. And if you sequence the virus, remember I said, this is actually a pretty mutable virus, up to 5% mutation rate in uh, one individual. Only one single mutation was observed that caused an escape within uh, a specific epitope. So this pink NS5B protein had multiple uh, CD4 and CD8 targets. One mutation was acquired that allowed the virus to escape uh, that CD4 or CD8 recognition. So this is the good response. So now we wanna look at the bad response. So this is what the bad response looks like. So no viral control or very limited viral controls, very high levels, this is in the yellow. Eventually the liver heals itself because it goes through that proliferation, uh, but you're gonna have these recurring rounds now, you see out at about a year, it starts spiking up again in the ALT level. So the liver's still under stress. Uh, if we look at the number of epitopes that are targeted, the CD8 response goes up early, but then uh, contracts very quickly. And we're gonna see why. Uh, by six months, it's dropped very low and it's, its overall magnitude is much lower than what we saw in the healthy patient. CD4 becomes basically undetectable by six months and is also lower. If we look at the epitopes that are targeted, we see there were diverse epitopes targeted, but there was a delay in the onset of the, the epitopes that were targeted. And by three months, a lot of the epitopes were targeting the NS3 protein. So the magnitude of the response was really focused on a single immunodominant 
protein, NS3, and that's where uh, the, the immune response was, was trying to uh, pressure the virus. If we look at the humoral responses, this looks very different than the last slide. We actually develop a very strong neutralizing antibody response. Basically all of the antibodies as measured by ELISA are also neutralizing antibodies and they do nothing. The virus is uh, still uncontrolled. And now we see the real crux of the matter, which is that over time, mutations were uh, being accumulated in the key proteins that were being targeted by the CD4 and CD8 T cells. And in particular, this, this immunodominant NS3 protein at three months acquired this mutation. You can see the collapse of that response up here, uh, the collapse of the CD2 response and the collapse of the MS5B response. And so the virus is escaping from the productive control by adaptive immunity. Um, and so it's really a question of whether or not you make this good Th1 response that drives CD8 T cells. And if they can be maintained at a high level, then you can get rid of the virus or at least keep it under persistent control. So things that are gonna uh, interfere with that are any sort of regulatory response. So negative feedback regulatory cells, including things like T regulatory cells, which we just briefly touched on yesterday, but are a form of CD4 T cell that try to limit immunopathology by shutting down immune responses once tissue damage starts occurring. So we know we're getting tissue damage in hepatitis C, and so uh, this is this these cell types going to use a number of mechanisms to try to shut down immune responses, but including secreting anti-inflammatory cytokines like TGF beta and IL-10, and that'll shut down and, and limit the CD4 TH1 response and the CD8 CTL response, and that's going to make uh, the person more susceptible, even if the response is intended to protect their liver from from tissue damage. Um, and this is another example of why, as immunologists, we often just like to measure cytokines because we can see the activity of these Tregs just by measuring a soluble marker in the blood without having to try to get cells out of somebody's liver. Okay, so if we look at people that controlled acute infection, um, it was found that they actually, um, <laughs> so this is looking at the percent of interferon stimulated genes that uh, went up in a number of different individuals. So how many uh, of the inter in, of the ISGs, the, the response to interferon was detected in these individuals with the people on this end having a very high response and um, how that correlates with their um, uh, uh, HCV levels. And so there was this nice uh, inverse correlation with if you had more of an interferon response, you had less HCV overall. And this led um, observations like this and sort of just logic led to some of the very first treatments for HCV, uh, which uh, had also been tried in some other infections like SARS-CoV-2, which was giving people directly more type 1 interferon. So this is something you're going to make yourself, makes you feel real sick, um, but maybe you're not making enough of it. So we're going to give you even more and try to really boost up that innate response with the ultimate goal of actually driving the right kind of adaptive immune response. So this was the first therapy introduced for HCV. The full mechanisms of action was probably, was, was unclear though the obvious hypothesis is that it just was overall boosting your normal interferon response pathway. Whether it worked depended on the genotype of the virus if you had already started out with reasonable control of your HCV RNA and when you started getting treated um, and uh, the, the, um, the, the uh, kinetics of decline uh, suggested that immune modulation might play a role. Um, and so that the interferon is really overcoming some of these regulatory negative feedback loops like the Tregs that I just talked about. It's just really driving that innate response to try to boost up the adaptive immune response. But the specific mechanism hasn't really been uh, directly um, uh, demonstrated. And so you see this initial first phase where there's this rapid drop in viral levels. That's what's measured here on the y-axis. And then the second phase of uh, long, slow decline, which was inferred to be the clearance of the infected hepatocyte. So you're getting less virus just being directly secreted out of the cells, but you still have this reservoir of infected cells that are maintaining virus. So then a, um, a second drug was introduced and that was um, ribavirin. Um, and so this combination therapy was shown to be significantly more effective. So interferon alone only yielded a 20 to 25% response and people getting this for 12 to 18 months. And again, this is no fun to get because it's basically going to give you a fever and make you feel really, really sick. Um, but combination theory with combination therapy with the broad-based uh, ribavirin uh, resulted in 40% of individuals going into that sustained virological response um, up to 65% in these uh, more treatable uh, genotypes. And that's just demonstrated here across multiple studies. So what is viravirin and how does it work? 
So it was actually initially designed in the 60s as an influenza drug. Um, and it's a nucleoside analog. So that means it's made to look like the building blocks of RNA so that when the virus is replicating, it uses ribavirin over um, the, uh, the nucleotides inside the cell. And it's not a productive uh, component of the replication of, of, of an RNA molecule. It's been used for a lot of things. It's used to treat Ebola. It was used to treat RSV. It was used to treat flu. It's very expensive. It's used often in immunocompromised populations, and it was used also in SARS-CoV-2. There have been multiple mechanisms for how proposed for how it works, including um, it having direct immunomodulatory properties separate from its uh, antiviral uh, properties. It's thought to maybe inhibit um, enzymes that uh, that synthesize nucleotides. So rather than replacing a nucleotide, it's just blocking the host side of things in terms of nucleotide synthesis, which is still going to slow down viral replication. And uh, of course, direct inhibition of the RNA polymerase in HCV by replacing a normal nucleotide, um, mutating the H HCV genomes by incorporating in the genomes and causing errors to be made when those genomes then try to be replicated, and then uh, modulation of how interferon-stimulated genes are made, actually increasing interferon-stimulated gene expression. And so a lot of work had gone into trying to um, define um, what uh, would uh, resolve ribavirin's mechanism. And, and some of the papers uh, that Andreas has provided in the references actually look at this directly with modeling. Um, and uh, what was done was measuring all different types of outcomes with people or cultures treated with ribavirin versus uh, interferon alone. And so uh, there was a thought if it was, uh, the hypotheses were that if it was immunomodulatory, it should have an independent effect on the immune response um, from interferon. If it inhibited uh, this uh, enzyme that synthesized uh, guanosine, it should reduce uh, viral production and be guanosine dependent. So you should be able to rescue by adding guanosine. If it directly inhibited the RNA polymerase, you should see again a reduction of viral production, but also see an increase in mutations occurring in NS5B. If it induced uh, lethal mutagenesis, you should actually be able to see the same amount of viral RNA produced, but there should be accumulating sequence variation at a much higher rate that's sort of uh, depicted here. And most of those mutations are gonna be lethal because most uh, random mutations are not going to be productive. Um, Actually, one of the, um, the Merck drug for SARS-CoV-2 kind of works on this theory. And finally, um, there were uh, investigation of looking for direct antiviral effects from interferon, shifting ISG expression away from the negative feedback pathways that it induces. Um, so um, it took a long time to really model this because um, uh, working with HCV was much harder than working with something like flu because there were no, uh, there were very poor in vitro culture systems. There were no mouse models. Um, it was hard. Uh, people designed individual drugs to, um, to mirror each of these features of um, ribavirin uh, independently because ribavirin had quite a lot of toxicity and neither, none of the individual drugs worked as well as ribavirin. Um, and um, this kind of touches on some of the uh, conversations we had this morning where talking about modeling, a biological mechanism can seem really plausible, but it can be difficult to prove conclusively when your model systems are really limited. Um, and especially in this case where the drug was really a very nonspecific, broadly acting drug. And so um, I, I, as we go through some of the modeling examples this afternoon uh, and tomorrow, uh, you'll see some examples of how this type of uh, problem has been approached um, in treatment. Um, and uh, just for the sake of completeness, it's very much worth mentioning that there now are very targeted drugs for HCV that target some of these NS3 proteins, including the um, polymerase. And, um, and these have been remarkably effective. Uh, so, so, so Fuspavir um, in particular, and um, Bosepravir and Telepravir. And in combination, uh, this uh, shows the rate of sustained virological response. Remember back here, we were excited about 30 to 40%. And over here, we're getting 96 to 98%. So this is actually a real cure for a viral infection because these drugs were designed specifically to bind to these uh, viruses, proteins. And in combination, 
the drugs are not allowing the virus to escape uh, uh, this um, this treatment. And so it's been remarkably, remarkably effective, and it's really changing the course of um, HCV as a, as, a, as a pathogen for humans. There's no animal reservoir for this like there was for flu. And so this could really be uh, eliminated as a public health problem if there was support for mass treating individuals and detecting individuals who um, may not know that they are infected with HCV if they are one of these people that are controlling it reasonably well. Um, so that is uh, what I'm going to tell you about HCV. 